appreciate the time today. My first part of my presentation is very personal, and one of the reasons it is, it's not uh, who we are really fundamentally shapes how we trade too, right? So I'm a big believer, man. Like if you're a, you know, if you're a big risk taker, then you're going to take big risks, right? If you're really conservative, then you know you're you're not going to be. In the beginning, I was trying to be an absolute home run hitter, right? And I struck out more than I did anything else. And uh, so, so it was later on that I kind of learned who I am a little bit. But anyway, I just want to share my journey with you, and I'm really thankful to those who shared the knowledge with me. Uh, pretty awkward to give a presentation and tell you I don't really know if there's much of an original thought in here. I think most of this I've actually learned from these guys. Uh, I have a couple little twists that I do myself that I'll talk to you about. Uh, go ahead, next slide. Just real quick about my background. I'm from a, I'm a small town boy. I'm from Willard, Ohio. About 12,000 people, man. You blank when you drive through, you'll miss it. Got out of high school in 87. Uh, started some college. Actually, wasn't sure what I wanted to do. I actually ended up going to the US Army for a while. I was in the infantry, who uh, Graduated from Ohio State in 95. I got an executive MBA from Kent State in 2000. But I never really learned about the stock market, right? <clears throat> in the education process, they taught me investment, and it was all buy and hold, right? And uh, I had investment classes even, but uh, it wasn't really how to increase my wealth actively. It was very passive, so it was okay, fundamentals, you buy it, you hold it forever. You can go ahead and do the next one. I'm gonna try to click through this pretty quick. Uh, real quick, uh, a little bit about my family. Uh, I, my wife and a soon to be six-year-old son, and really, that's why I chose to trade. I love my family, everybody loves their family, right? But man, my family is my inspiration, and I love them more than oxygen. But uh, I got out of college, I went to work for General Motors. I did all the right things, right? Like you hear we're supposed to do. So I started investing in my 401k, I bought mutual funds, I, I maxed my Ross, I did all that, so all the right things. <clears throat> it wasn't until later on that I started to really look at the fees that I was being charged with. Some of these things are charging like two, three percent, you know, it's sick, right, with what these guys are charging. I was being outpaced by the markets. So I was gaining money and I was building wealth, but then when I looked at the S&P and the S&P was up 18% and my account was up 14%, you know? And, uh, and a lot of that, I didn't really understand the sector. So if like a biomed or a biotech was, was running really well, then guess what? I just buy my biotech mutual funds and everything knows when it's overbought, what happens? People start taking profits, right? So it started going down. So like, I just wasn't keeping up with the market. So then I decided, okay, well, I'm going to start buying stocks. So what's the first thing I did? I bought things that I liked, and I bought them when they were up. Apple stock's going up. I like Apple. I like Apple products, so I'll buy Apple, right? So, <clears throat> and I was buying and holding. I'm going to go to the next slide. So my initial experience with buying stocks was pretty much a train wreck, man. What was I doing? I was buying high. They would start to go down. I'd be selling low. I'd start to get nervous. And basically, it was an absolute train wreck, right? I just really didn't know how to play the game. Thankfully, I did no real damage. I mean, I kind of, I had some winners, some losers, but all I did was pretty much tread water. So then I had a realization, basically, okay, I'm not as smart as I thought I was, so I'm ignorant, completely ignorant about this game, and then I said, well, you either you need to learn to play the game, or you stop and accept mediocrity and investing, right? So I decided to go ahead and do that. So the first thing I did, probably like most of the people, uh, I started on, and this is where my journey pretty much began, right? So I read a couple books, and I know a lot of people don't like investing books. I actually found a couple books that were pretty decent for me to at least get started. And it was some introductions to technical analysis. One of them was this one. You know, I thought it was actually by Stephen Bigelow, and it was all about candlestick patterns, right? So I was kind of shocked that, wow, when something's oversold, you know, these candlesticks with very high probabilities can, can tell you when a potential reversal is gonna take place. So I started to make a few successful trades, but it wasn't enough. I was starting to see a little bit, I was kind of treading water, maybe getting a little bit ahead, but I was still being outpaced a lot. So I decided to take some introductory seminars about trading. So anytime they had something around Houston, I would go. I took some classes actually, and some stocks and some options, but the class was terrible. I mean, basically I threw away a couple thousand dollars. So that company's out of business now, and it's really no big surprise. But uh, I knew I needed more, and I always say I'm, I'm a faithful person, and uh, I'm a family guy, but I always say if you truly look and you keep looking, man, God's going to give you what you need, right? Doesn't always give you what you want, but I do believe he'll give you what you need. So uh, fortunately, I found Bulls on Wall Street and Canal and Paul. I took the 60-day boot camp, and I took it multiple times. It wasn't like I took it one time, and I was a fanatic. My wife used to laugh. She'd come into my office, and she's like, oh, you got class tonight? And I'm like, oh, no, I'm watching the replay. So I was watching the replay, and I'm typing notes, and I'm like printing charts. I mean, I was a fanatic, right? Like, I was a complete bulldog. I mean, I watched classes three, four times, and 
you know, I'd bother Canal. He was awesome. He'd always answer questions. And, you know, he always says some of his better students are the biggest pains in the butt. Well, I was definitely the biggest pain in the butt, and I'm not sure how successful, but, uh, you know, I'm making, making some green now. So, anyway, finally I found something that works, right? So, next slide. So, basically, the difference between then and now. Uh, I was definitely not an overnight success, but man, I was like a bulldog. I mean, I just held on, and I just kept, kept watching classes, kept looking. I literally looked at thousands of charts. I mean thousands of charts. I used to lay on the, the couch with my iPad, a charting platform, and man, I'd look at charts and I'd try to, you know, support resistance levels, look at candle patterns, moving averages, try to find correlations, things that worked. And I didn't really know much about sector analysis initially. That, that was a big change in my trading when I really started to learn about sector analysis. I still had some failed trades, in the beginning, I traded way, way too big. And unfortunately, and I know this sounds kind of odd, but I had some, ex some success initially when I started day trading. And that almost hurt me because I made a few trades that I didn't realize how far out of my league was. I mean, I'd do a thousand shares of Tesla, right? Like on a day trade. And now I was sick, really. But it's funny because like the first three trades, like I hit them. And I thought, oh my gosh, man, I'm going to be retiring in like four years. You know what I mean? Like, I'm going to be out. Well, guess what? Just like this guy, you know, he had a little bit of success. He had $181 million, but you can see he met the love of his life the next day after he won the lottery. The cat's way out of his league, right? Well, so am I, and so was I. And it's funny because my wife saw this picture and she says, hey, that kind of looks like you and me. So I had to throw that in there. But finally, well, sorry, go back up. <laughs> But finally, I started to hold my own, man, and I saw a little bit of green on the screen, right? So the thing that I did was, like, I would think about it, and I was a big, like, Einstein mental experiment guy, right? Like, I would think about it. He used to talk about mental experiments all the time. I'd have an idea, I'd try it, I'd do it, I'd do it again, I'd do it again, I'd keep doing it. And finally, I started to have some success, right? And I was excited because, man, to see green on my screen, I was like, wow, this is awesome. Next slide. So it took me a while to really realize what I was good at, okay? What were my strengths? I absolutely refused to quit. You have to refuse to quit, right? You just, I mean, if you accept failure, you're done. So I'm like, there's no way I'm gonna fail at this. Uh, one thing that I did is, because I looked at thousands of charts, I mean, literally thousands, I, did, I started to see the patterns really well. It's easy when you look back at something to see the patterns. As they're forming, it's a lot harder, right? But I looked at so many charts, I started to see and actually be able to predict with pretty high levels of accuracy. So there's nothing better, and can all mention it the other day, chart time, right? You have to do chart time. The other thing I started to realize, I was a base hitter. I was not a home run hitter. No. Uh, and I want to explain something to you, like the difference between the two, and I'm sorry, I'm a big baseball fan. I know you guys are a lot of football fans, but I'm a, I've always been a big Detroit Tigers fan and love baseball my whole life. The difference between a 265 hitter and a three hitter is about one hit a week. That's it, man, one hit a week. But in salary, the difference is well over a million dollars a year difference, right? So sometimes you can make these little adjustments in your strategy or what you're doing, and all of a sudden you can go from being kind of mediocre or not good at all, either one, to doing like really well, right? So that was it for me. So the first thing I started doing is, first of all, my risk to reward, okay? Initially, uh, I, I, like one-to-one -one trades, right? I had to be right 50% of the time. I know these guys talk about this. Please forgive me for drilling it over and over again. But it was very, very substantial to me, this idea, right? So then all of a sudden, I started to realize, okay, well, if I take one and a half risk to reward, I'll have to be right 40% of the time, right? If I do 1.75%, I only have to be right 37% of the time to break even, to break even. And two to one, I have to be right 33%. And people are like, what? Okay, we just figured out. Lose one, lose one, win one, right? Lost two, made two. Made three trades, and you've just broken even. Minus commission, right? So, so that was huge for me. If I stayed in this area, I had to be almost, I mean, I had to be perfect, right? To really start to get ahead. And that's the key. You can be, you can be right half the time, half the time, and you can kill it if you're over in here, right? And so that was a big difference for me. I used to also, every time I had a failed trade, I would, it would hurt me emotionally. Like, oh man, I'm a loser, I'm this and that. It was really tough for me because it, it, what was really good was I'd see these guys lose a trade and I thought, man, if they lose a trade, they're not upset at all because they know the statistics are gonna play out. 
So my biggest stress to you is if you're down in here, you're gonna have problems. The other thing that I had to learn, I really had to stop and think about money, right? Initially, some of the trades that I hit, I did really well on. So I always wanted to get back to that pinnacle, right? But I couldn't, and I was failing. The other thing I had to really stop and think, I'd be up 800 bucks on a trade, I would not walk away because I wanted 1,000. And I'd already hit my risk to reward because that thousand dollar number to me was like a pinnacle, right? You know, so, and, and I would, I'd walk away. And then finally I started thinking, man, what the hell is the matter with you, right? Like, man, I'm $800 a day, guys, $200,000 a year. I was walking away from 200 grand a year, basically was what I was doing. And I was letting things retrace on me. And I was already at this 1.5 to 1.75 level, right? I mean, what was I doing? It was crazy. <laughs> So once I realized that, that's when things really started to turn for me. And I realized I don't have to try and hit home runs to do well. I don't. And, and you know, like Pete Rose, man, I was talking about the gambling thing, right, in the Hall of Fame. But this guy wasn't a home run hitter. Man, he was incredibly successful. What did he do? He hustled. Even if he had something bad coming off his bat into the infield and he knew he was going to get thrown out at first, that guy never lollygagged. You watched him, man, he busted his tail to get to first base because he, that's just who he was, right? And I realized as a trader, that's how you have to be, right? You got to scratch and claw for everything that you get and you have to be thankful for what you get. So <clears throat> anyway, a base hitter, not a home run hitter. And that's not who I wanted to be, but I learned to embrace it. And man, what a difference it's really made in my trading, right? So not everything will work for you too, and you have to find out what works for you. Some people trade breakouts really good, right? Like I only trade breakouts first thing in the morning. When I'm swing trading, I don't trade breakouts at all. I just don't trade them well, right? Doesn't mean that they don't work. My personality, things start to retrace, they pull back under that previous resistance level. I start to be a little bit nervous, you know, I'm like, ah. I'm a pullback trader when I swing trade mostly, right? So, you know, I think it's a little better risk to reward and I just don't trade them. I don't trade the breakouts that well. And it's okay, you're gonna to learn tons of techniques. I'm gonna tell you, I think they all work. I see them all work, but I don't trade them all. I trade what works for me. So I just encourage you to do what fits your trading style. And the more you do it, the more you're gonna learn what you like and what you don't like. Next time. Now I'll talk to you a little bit about how I trade and what I trade. So first and foremost, my absolute bread and butter, I am a swing trader. So I know a lot of you day traders are be like, oh, okay, you know. But that's who I am, right? I'm a swing trader. So basically I seek to make about five to five to fifteen percent in a matter of days. Anywhere from one day to two weeks, three weeks maybe. Right? If it gets much beyond that, then you know I'm tied up a little bit too long. I want to turn my money and I want to build wealth, right? That's what I want to do. The next thing, I'm an option trader. And on the option side, I'm not a big home run guy. Like I won't buy like out of the money calls or puts and then expect these big monster moves. I'm a base hit guy and I'll explain that to you a little bit later. But uh, so, so I'm an option trader, base hit, base hit again and again. And more specifically, I'm an option seller. And one of the reasons why is if you look at it, this, there's a little thing on Investopedia and it's a little bit dated, <clears throat> but this includes future contracts, S&P, NASDAQ, uh, even some currency stuff, uh, some futures with like live cattle and like an average. But the percent of expired put options that basically expire worthless, and this is dated, I'm sorry, I couldn't find anything earlier, was 82.6% of the time. So if you buy a put option, and you're, I'm gonna to explain to you what that is a little bit later, you have about an 82% chance across all of these markets it's gonna expire worthless. Think about that. So who makes money? The buyer, because you buy something and it expires worthless, or the guy who sold it to you who keeps the money? That's why I'm an option seller. And I'll explain to you a little bit more about that. That's pretty powerful. Uh, I'm a part-time day trader. It's kind of my alter ego, right? Like, that's where I love to try to hit a little bit of a home run, not too much. I'm a lot more conservative than I used to be. But uh, I try to make money fast. I'm in and out. Uh, I'm watching patterns. I'm using the one and the five minute charts primarily. Unbelievably, which is kind of weird for my personality because most of my trading is slower. I trade the open like really good, right? So. I, I don't know why, but I do. I trade the open relatively well, and that's what I like. So after about the half, about, after about the first half hour, 40 minutes, I'm out. If I sit, I get back the rest of the day, man. I get back. It just, I just don't do it well. So uh, the other thing is, I am a position trader too. 
fortunately, uh, and I mean this humbly, but I've been very blessed and, and I've saved for so long that I've accumulated a little bit of wealth and uh, over time. So, so my account's decent size. So what I do is uh, I only trade a small portion of that account with uh, swing trading and then with options. So I do so a lot of position trading too. And I even buy some uh, uh, ETFs, right? Like some Vanguard ETFs too, just to try to leverage more of the account a little bit more. But uh, so basically uh, what I'm looking for is I'm looking like kind of 100% in three month or longer terms, like 100% returns in like three months to maybe even a year and a half, right? Uh, so longer returns. I'm seeking value. And what I'm looking for is I'm looking for damaged stocks, not damaged companies. That's important to remember, right? If the company's damaged, don't stay away from it, right? You know? And uh, like, uh, like D-Bold right now, I don't know if anybody follows DBD, right? But uh, they're tanking. They used to be a great company. DBD used to be a great company. And uh, they make uh, like ATM machines, all that kind of stuff too. We know with electronic transfers and like all this kind of stuff too. I mean, a lot of times people don't even go to the ATMs anymore. You got Apple Pay, you got all this kind of stuff, you know? JP Morgan started to chose, uh, close some units down, although they're doing well, the ATM makers, and d has got a lot of debt, that kind of stuff too, so. But anyway, so that's what I'm looking for. Uh, basically too, like with options trading, there are some, a lot of different tools to you, and I'll go into a little bit more of this in detail. But uh, uh, stocks, and I know as technical analysis guys, we don't like to think about this, but uh, basically they follow bell, shirt, bell curves and statistics, right? So you can move a slider basically to a date and see the probability that that stock is gonna be above or below. And that's based on a random walk theory, right? Well, the way options are priced is basically off of statistics, and it's a very complex mathematical equation, right? So they use this kind of tool. Well, I'll use this to find the percentage that a stock's gonna be above or below a certain level when I make my option trades, okay? But my technical analysis puts me way ahead of this. And, and I'll explain that to you a little bit more. I use options tables, which I'm gonna go over. Uh, if you dislike me now, you're gonna dislike me even more by the time I go over the Greeks. <laughs> but, we, but we have to go through it, and it's simple, I promise. I'm gonna go through it, and you're gonna be like, because I, I actually got mad at the guy who was teaching me options. I thought, there's no way this is that complicated, man. You're a butthead just trying to impress me and make me think how smart you are, right? Or make me think how smart you are. I hate those people. So, <laughs> I do too, I can't stand it, right? But we're gonna go through it, but then I'm gonna show you, and then I'm gonna step back and I'm gonna show you like just a few things you have to remember out of that whole big mess of crap. And I'm gonna make it quick. Obviously five minute charts. The other thing I do is I use the sectors a lot too, especially, <laughs> right? You know, and, uh, and I'm a huge, huge believer in weekly charts. And we'll talk a little bit more about weekly charts. Uh, go ahead, next slide. So with my position trading, so uh, I'm, I'm tracking and I'm looking for signals, right? <coughs> when I look for signals, basically the more oversold, the better. That is so, so important in your price action, right? So the, the more oversold, the better when you're looking for a buy signal. And, and once again, it's so important. So what am I looking for? I'm looking for bullish engulfing candles. I'm looking for hammer candles. I'm looking for BACs. This is my poor attempt at humor. What is a BAC? That's a big ass candle. That's my turn, right? You'll probably never hear that again but it's a big ass candle. And I'm also looking for gap ups. The other thing that I always say is that if it's obvious to me, it's gonna be obvious to everybody else out there trading, right? So if you have to look at something and go, is that a hammer? Or is that a bullish engulf thing? Does that, you know, does that encompass that? And I'll, I'll explain this a little bit more here. Most of you are probably familiar with it. Then stay away from it, right? If it's not obvious to you, it's not obvious to others. You can always, always use a phrase, if it's not tight, it ain't right, right? Like in a flag pattern, if it's not tight, Stay away from it, right? Same thing with the candle pattern. So, and so what you see, this is the sector, right? This is the sector, but you can see the steel, steel bled out. And I'm actually in the steel business for oil fill products, right? So you can see it come down and found some, found some, some support. It broke the support once again. Looked like it was going to get some. It broke over here. It breaks again. Every time it breaks the support level, it flushes, right? And you can see this break. There's the support level. It flushes. It comes down. It comes down. All of a sudden, this doesn't show capitulation very well, but, but I've got some charts of you. And then what do you see right here? You see a hammer candle. You can see that hammer. If you look, especially on a weekly chart, at almost every one of these big downturns, you're gonna see one of these candle patterns. I'm gonna go over that again. U.S. Steel, I follow U.S. Steel a lot. You can start to see the volume come right in, right? So obviously the more volume, the more sustainable or the more realistic the move. I mean, this thing, I think it was up around on the weekly, 
might have been, I don't know, please forgive me, 80, 100 million shares, right? That's not retail traders, right? That are buying shares like that. That's the big guys, the hedge funds. I always say I'm like a sucker fish on the side of a whale, right? All I want to do is follow the whales, is all I'm trying to do, follow the footprints, right? So, okay, uh, sorry, I think that I finished that slide. Please forgive me. Uh, let's see, uh, yeah, volume kip capitulation, and sorry, but uh, you know, basically the dumb money's running, right? When you see that, but they have to ask themselves at the bottom, right? Like, if I'm selling, you know, who's doing all the buying down here? Especially when you start to see high volumes come in. Uh, I do look at moving averages, and I'm going to go over some of these charts in more detail. I know Canal covers this, and, and and Paul does too as well. But uh, you know, the moving some of these things I want to stress are very important to me. Uh, the moving averages, I look for flattening. I look for them to start to remount. I look for big voids away from the nine EMA. And I've got a chart that summarizes all of this. And uh, that basically can lead the signal. On the daily, obviously, lower highs and lower lows start to become higher highs and higher lows, right? Things are starting to get bought up. You know, things run up, you have a pullback, they start to get bought up again. You know, that, that's what. That's all of a sudden you know you have a making of a new trend. Canal and Paul, I'm sorry, I've scalped all your stuff, man. Not an original thought in there, I'm sorry. That's great. So, keep going. So basically, planning your trade. You can look for bottoming or you can do position trading, right? So, that's a little bit different. Position trading, your cost average down. Uh, bottoming patterns, basically what you're gonna look for is you're gonna, you're gonna have more of one type of buy and then you may even stop out. Position trading, you won't stop out. But uh, basically, budget your account. So what I do, I have a portion of my account for swing trading, I have a portion for options, and I have a portion for position, position trading. All my day trading is done in a separate aggressive account. Uh, how much <coughs> per position? So like, if you're gonna position trade, don't buy all at once. Do not buy all at once, okay? Split it into either like quarters or thirds, but do not buy all at once. And my first instinct was I bought too heavy at first. The next thing, look for previous support levels and are you seeing a signal at those levels? What's the volume pattern? Are you still seeing distribution, high reds, uh, or are you starting to see some green come in? The rationale, basically. I also, like I'm a news guy, and I'm also a fundamental guy, and I know you guys probably want to kick me for that one, but uh, I follow fundamentals a lot, and I listen to the news, like what's going on, right? Like with oil, you know, is Saudi Arabia cutting back production? Are the Iran, uh, I watch CNBC constantly, you know, what's happening with Iran? Are the are the uh, restrictions uh, being placed back on Iran again, those types of things. So funda fundamental changes, are there earnings that just came out? Is there leadership changes that are expected to be good? Do they have any new technology? What about elections? Obviously the tariffs, right? So, it, uh, you know, tariffs, so, and when President Trump was elected as well, the tax cuts, you know, all that. So, and that helps me, and I watch the sectors a lot. Anyway, end game is to get to the lowest co average possible possible spot. So, and, and then you gotta decide where you're gonna sail. So, sell, excuse me. You have to scale out, you know. You get to 100% of your investment. If you're up 100%, man, take out, at least make sure you got your original investment out, right? Take it out and let the rest ride, you know? And uh, so, uh, let's see, ignore the experts too. Uh, they'll be trashing when the smart money's doing the buying. And it was funny because like I was doing my sector analysis and I was watching and I was watching real estate, right? Real estate's getting hit. And I mean, you could see every time it broke a support level, man, look at the flush, it was flushing, right? And all of a sudden, things are gonna become cheap enough that people want to start buying again, right? So while I'm watching the news, I'm watching CNBC, oh, real estate's getting crushed because, you know, the Fed's raising rates and rates obviously impact mortgage rates and, you know, all this and that, and it's, oh, it's terrible, it's terrible. And then what do, I, what do I see right here? Look at that. That's a big, clear hammer right at the bottom. And look at this, it's beautiful. Look at the capitulation volume right there, right? So, and it's funny, I was watching CNBC and all these guys that are trash, and I started buying real estate. I, I started buying it. What the heck? You know what I mean? The chart's telling me to buy it. So, although I'm a fundamental guy, price action does rule. So, hopefully that'll stop me from getting beat up. Okay. Different levels and signals. Here's like another <coughs> chart. This is the biggest trade I made in my entire life. I will love Marathon Oil forever and ever. Uh, I'm in the oil business. The reason I did Marathon, they were more volatile companies, but they're pretty big, they had some pretty good cash. I knew they could weather the storm, right? So I was watching this bleed out. I was drawing all my support levels. Now once again, I'm on a weekly chart. This is different, right, than a lot of people look at. So I saw every time these support levels got broke, this thing was flushing, right? 
And you can see it. Here we had a remount. But look, look at the moving averages on the weekly. I'm convinced a lot of the longer term big hedge funds, I'm convinced, you can tell me I'm wrong, I believe they trade on the weekly. I truly do. You see correlations in all the different time frames, but I, I believe a lot of them do because they can't get in and out of all those massive positions in a day, right? They have too many shares they have to buy. So they have to buy a little bit, wait a little bit, buy a little more, they have to sell a little bit, they have to wait, they have to sell a little bit more, this and that. I'm convinced the longer time frames for the bigger guys, they use a lot. So, Marathon had some cash, it comes down, finds support, breaks again, it comes down. Now this is what I started to see. Also I knew oil, 26 bucks a barrel. There was no way oil at 26 was sustainable. Absolutely no way. I knew production costs, I knew all that. So what did I see? I saw this high volume coming in. You see high red, high red here, but look at the price. It kind of really wasn't moving that much anymore, right? So you have very, very high volume here, you have high volume here, but your prices are staying in a relatively thin band, right? That kind of tells me that instead of just distribution, you're starting to get a little bit of accumulation to take place, right? So basically, and please forgive me because I, I was dumb money and sometimes I still am, but basically, man, who's selling down here? The sheep are getting slaughtered, right? You know, it's sad, really, I mean, kind of. You know, these guys, so they're selling their positions, right? Who's buying? The smart guys are buying. And then you can see what happened. We have a ton of large volume come in, right? And you see, see a lot of strength come in. I was buying, I was cost average at $6.50 a marathon. I've done a lot of dumb stuff in my life. Hit buy when I mean to sell and vice versa. I did it the other day. It cost me dearly, I'll tell you about that later. But this is one good thing that, that I did, right? So I was cost averaging about six fifty. I remember I, my wife asking me, she's like, are you sure? And I'm like, nope, I'm not. <laughs> Best trade of my entire life, man. And I ended up selling at about sixteen fifty. So I went from six bucks to sixteen fifty, right? You only need a couple of those trades in your life to like really kind of set you ahead, right? Now you want to be careful. I, I leveraged my account pretty heavy and I had a really you know good feel for the markets and this kind of stuff. But that was one of the best trades. But I want to show you that the weeklies and you know following the volume pattern, and I learned all this from these guys, right? It's not an original thought here. Keep going. I look at related items a lot. So I was looking at oil. Oil, this is a weekly slide. You can see we have some big, big downturns, right? And then all of a sudden you start to see kind of a bullish engulfing strength, uh, strong candle comes right up to the 9 EMA of the weekly, right? Once again, so we see we see some pops. Look at the hammer candle here. And then all of a sudden we have some pops up. See a lot of tails up, like a position trade and something like this. Because over time it will decay, right? But, but I, this was pretty good as an example. So here, uh, and I'm looking at the weekly on this, I believe. Sorry, I don't have my time. Yeah, this is a weekly chart, right? So here you see it. I have a general trend line. I draw lines on my charts like crazy, right? So first of all, do we have an extended downtrend? We have a huge downtrend, right? And then all of a sudden, what do we start to see? We start to see some really long wicks. Long wicks or hammer candles are big clues to me, right? Because what's happening, you know, something's opening here, it's going all the way down to the bottom for the low, but all of a sudden buyers are starting to come in and start to see some push up on this, right? So that's a big clue. Uh, the other thing I look for is if you have a big gap away from the nine EMA, you see how you start to have big gaps in here, right? Like you're, you know, up here, you're close to the nine, down here you have this big gap. I'm starting to see this signal. So that's usually a good indication too. It's kind of, you're very oversold at that time. You see these big gaps away from the nine, okay? Um, all of a sudden you start to hold the support level. You see all this, things are kind of starting to round out and you're starting to hold. What do I see right here? I see a bullish engulfing candle. See that? Should be pretty clear to everybody. Right here, holding that bottom. And then you can see what happens with the bottom. So, when you look at it, now once again, in retrospect, it's pretty easy. Also, what do you see right here? Look at the volume. Capitulation, right? You see this huge volume. And then all of a sudden you see your volume pattern and you start to accumulate. Next slide. Is this pace okay? Am I boring you guys? No, no, no. That's great. No, you guys, okay, be brutal on me because my wife likes to give me a hard time. Okay, well, uh, these charts are gonna look obscene to you. Uh, but I believe it or not, I use everything on here. Uh, multiple time frames. Anytime I'm taking a trade, I always use the daily and the weekly. I like them side by side, and one of the reasons why, <coughs> if you look at AMD, 
you can see AMD makes a nice little run up here and it pulls back. So this level, you can, you can tell it's starting to find some support, right? Like there, there, and there. But how significant is that? Well, you look over to the left and you're kind of, uh, I don't know, look at the weekly. Resistance, resistance, and bam, right back to support. The other thing when I tell you that I believe that a lot of the big guys use the weeklies, look at the nine EMA on the weekly. Everybody see that right there? Kicking right off the nine on the weekly. So if you're doing some longer term trading, watch this. Because right here, you see this is kind of in the middle of no man's land, right? It's not underneath the, it's definitely underneath the nine, it's underneath the twenties, it's not to the 50, right? So Kanal preaches about multiple time frames. And I do too, but on longer time frames, right? For some of the trading that I do. So hopefully that will convince you to at least start looking at. The other thing that I do, I do look at fundamentals. I look at uh, sales, I look at earnings per share, I look at debt to equity if I'm gonna hold something a long time, like how much equity do they have. I also, money flow is very, very important to me, right? So I wanna see money flow patterns. So I look at things like checking money flow and this and that. It's more of a, they don't trigger my trades, but they put me in a frame of mind. You know, like, am I a little more bullish? Am I less bullish or not? The other thing is, I watch the markets, big Because I'm taking longer term trades, right? So like here, you can see the Russell 2000 or the IWM, like, you know, when we're at resistance and it's been a big long run, long runs at resistance do not break. They don't break typically. Because people who bought in down here are happy with their profits when they get up here so there's more selling, right? The shorter runs, the multiple taps, once again, not an original thought in my presentation yet, that's when they break. So if we're up here and we've had an extended run, I'm starting to lighten up on my positions, right, if I'm swing trading. So that's I trade with the market, and that has been a huge difference in my trading. So, so I'm watching all the markets. I watch the T2108, which is an average of all the stocks. Is it going up? You know, is it going down with this S&P? Paul talks about divergences a lot. So I'm looking for divergences between the S&P and the T2108. If, if the T2108 or all the small caps are taking dives, but the S&P is staying high, then you know what? That your fundamental, your, your foundation is starting to crumble, right? The water's murky below, and you're gonna have problems. That's when you see big pullbacks. So I do look at fundamentals. Next slide. Now I'm gonna go into options real quick. So, options, what is an option? Very simply, it's a contract. So a buyer pays an option seller an amount called a premium for the right to buy, but not the obligation to buy a stock at a given price or strike price. You're gonna get aggravated at me, I promise I'm gonna pull it all together. So the buyer and the seller agree on length of time of the contract, which is called the expiration date. So the longer the agreement, the more expensive it is. What I want you to do is I want you to think of it just like insurance, right? If you buy a higher coverage on your car, okay, you're gonna pay more. If you buy a safer call or put, you're gonna pay more. If you buy a riskier, like you have lower coverage, you're taking more risk on your car, it's cheaper, okay? If you buy more time on an option contract, like if you buy a year premium, you pay for a whole year of insurance versus six months on your car, it's more expensive. It follows the insurance model very well, right? Uh, so here we have an options table, and you can see, so this one is for Salesforce. I love to trade Salesforce. Uh, so here you can see that these contracts expire in January 19, okay? January 2019. Uh, January 18th. There's weekly and monthly. I usually trade monthly options. There's more volume, more liquidity. So here you can see the price of these contracts. So once again, the 140 is $13.70. The 145 is 1090, and then down to 850 per contract for the 150. Now when I did this, Salesforce was at 143, right? So it's above the strike. So. 143, 143 is above this contract price, which I'm, I'm more secure and I'm gonna tell you, I'm gonna explain this more to you later here, but that's why this is 1370. The 150 is 850, $8.50, but I'm nowhere near 150 over here, so it's cheaper, right? In order for these options to be worth anything, 
on this expiration date, the stock price has to be above the strike price for it to be worth anything. So hopefully you can understand why the 140, because the stock is already at 143, there's a much higher probability it's gonna be above 140 at the close is the reason that it's more expensive at 1370. So this all starts making more sense as we go. Just like stocks, there's a bid to ask. Uh, there's a volume behind it. Kind of ignore this volume. These are, these are positions that are open. Uh, and there's open interest, which basically tells you how much interest there is in the option. I'm gonna give you some basic rules to follow, but anything above 50 has pretty good liquidity typically. There is a delta. This delta number that you see in here is for every dollar the stock moves, the option will move approximately this much. So if the stock goes up $1, this 13 70 cent call will go up 61 cents for every dollar the stock moves up. A little confusing, but I'm gonna pull it all together for you. Uh, We'll talk about theta, rho, gamma, and implied volatility here very shortly. But basically, the buyer says, I'll buy the right to buy 100 shares of CRM in the future for $150. So we're looking at the 150 strike price, okay, at the, at the end of January 2019. The seller says, okay, he goes, I'll sell you that right for $8.50 a share or $850 total. So he says, I'll, I'll pay you on January 19th at, their, at $150 or higher, I'll pay you. $8.50 per share to the seller. And he says, okay, so there's the price. Let's go to the next slide. It's gonna be a little confusing, bear with me. You have to hear it three or four times. The bottom line, what I'm gonna do is I'm gonna give you a set of rules that will keep you out of trouble. And I promise they'll keep you out of trouble. So now let's, let's look what happens if, okay, on January 18th, 2019 comes and CRM is less than $150. Remember for this option, to be worth anything at expiration, it's gotta be greater than 150. So now, so if January 18th comes and CRM's less than 150, it's called out of the money, it's worthless. So the buyer bought that and he gets nothing for his money. But look what happened. The seller keeps the stock and he keeps the 850 bucks, right? Now, I think you're starting to understand why I'm an option seller, okay? And I actually don't sell calls too much, I actually sell puts a lot, but I'll explain to you why. Uh, so, so anyway, that, that's the scenario there. Now, the nice thing is, is though, the seller of that contract, if he bought CRM at 100 and he was gonna sell it at 150 anyway, why not make another 850 bucks by selling the call, right? And then it gets to 850. So if you have a position of something that you're gonna hold for a long time, you can sell calls, but sell it at a level that you're gonna be comfortable getting rid of the stock, but you take in that premium and you keep that money if you sell it at 150. And I do that all the time. Like, I'll take a swing trade, but I know I'm gonna hold it for a while, it's a good <coughs> stock like CRM, and I'll sell a 150 call, I'll put 850 bucks in my pocket, I'm hoping it doesn't hit the 150, it'll go down, I'll keep the 850, and I keep selling covered calls. I do it again and again and again, right? And keeps taking in that premium. What, uh, so. what time frame are you selling the calls at? Quarterly, monthly? Usually, I, I usually sell monthly contracts. Sometimes I do weekly, but uh, I look at the weeklies. Usually I sell the monthlies, and I usually go about 45 days to 60 days to expiration normally. So I just, I took contracts uh, Friday morning. I sold two contracts, and they were September 21st expirations, which are pretty short. But I'm also selling October's too, and it depends upon the amount of premium I can get for it. But anyway, so let's take a look now. Now we'll look at the other end of the spectrum. So if January 18th comes, and CRM's at 200 bucks, so man, it blew through the 150 strike, right? I mean, it's rocking. The buyer gets the shares for 150 bucks. The buyer of the call. So he, so he, the 200 dollars. He gets it for 150 a share. Phenomenal. He did really well, right? And the seller, he keeps the, the 850. Is he upset? Yeah, probably a little bit, but you know what? He probably bought the stock at 100 anyway. So he made 50 bucks and he keeps the 850, so it is what it is. If, if my strike gets blown through, if I'm selling a call, I am never upset because you know what? I made money. I made money, so you can't get upset about it. But how much did the buyer make? So the buyer, basically, he, 
the 150 contract, right? It's at 200 now, so he's, he made $50 a share, right? Times 100 shares, all option contracts, you have to multiply times 100. So his contract isn't $13.70, it's 1,370. Does that make sense? So you have to multiply these numbers by that. So he gets $5,000 of profit, right? 50 times 100, 5,000. He has to take off the 850 because he paid the seller that 850, right? Basically, he made $4,150 within that profit, right? But what about before and after expiration? Like, say you get a really quick move, ignoring, and once again, I'm going to come back to this, but ignoring theta, rho, gamma, and implied volatility right here, okay? You don't have to hold these to expiration. You can sell them back to the market. They're liquid, right? It's like a stock. You don't have to hold it forever. Or an option contract, you don't have to hold it until it expires. You can buy it. If the stock's making a run up, you get that delta, and you can make some money, and then you sell it back to the market. They're very liquid, actually, most of them. So now, let's look at this way. CRM, which was at 143.91 on the day that I, that I made this chart on, moves to 148.91. So it's a $5 move. Made a $5 move, right? And it did it well before January 18th. So the option contract will move approximately, remember I told you it's delta? Take delta for every dollar the stock moved, right? On the 150 contract. So we know on the 150 contract, it's gonna move 41 cents for every dollar, okay? So the stock moved a stock level, uh, excuse me, I'm sorry, so it went $5, right? So it took $14,391 if you bought that stock. It moved $5, you had 100 shares, so you made $500, right? Your option, if you invested in the option, you put $850 in, was all you would have spent because you bought one contract at $8.50. So you have $850 invested, right? You got 41 cents, right? For every dollar the stock moved, it moved $5, so you get $2.05. And if I made a mistake in my math, yell, okay? Originally it was at 850, now it's at 1055, right? 1055. So look, if you bought the stock, I have to move this up a little bit. I think it's cutting off the bottom. Oh, one more second. You mind lifting up a little bit? Oh no, I'm sorry. I guess it wasn't. I apologize. Yeah. So the initial investment was fourteen thousand three hundred ninety-one. You made five hundred dollars in profit. You made a three point four percent gain, right? Now with the option, you spent eight hundred fifty bucks. You made two hundred and five dollars. Look at your profit. Twenty-four percent. Holy cow! How much do you have at risk? Theoretically, you had 14,391 at risk. CRM, or CRM's not gonna go to zero tomorrow, right? Unless there's a major cataclysmic catastrophe. But look, you only had $850 at risk. The maximum you could lose is your premium, and you made 24%. Now, you say, well, this guy made 500 bucks, okay? I could have bought two contracts. I could have spent $1,700, and I would have made $400. If I would have bought three contracts, I would have spent 25 something, right? $2,500, and I would have made $615, right? And I spent like $2,500, and here I spent 14,000, I made 500. So that's the power of an option. Huge percentages, right? And you can risk less. But I'm telling you, if you don't know how the stock moves, that's why this is so, so important. It's like giving a loaded handgun to a five-year-old, man. It's not gonna end good. So you, you have to understand how the stock moves and you have to understand your risks. Does that, does that kind of make sense to everybody? Okay, let's go to the next slide. You're gonna hate me, I'm sorry. <laughs> this guy summarizes it right here. He looked Greek and he looks like he's in pain, so I put that on there. Very quickly, I'll go through this fast. Call option, when you're buying a call, it's a bullish trade, okay? The delta, and if you guys want copies of this, I'll give you copies of this. Uh, um, so delta, the amount that a call option will move for every dollar the stock moves. Right here, pretty simple, right? Now, this is where it starts to get a little more complicated. So for the 145 call, right in the middle, you see that's 51 cents for every dollar, okay? So if the stock moves two bucks, the option moves a dollar two, right? But remember, the option costs you a fraction less. Note though that delta moves. I know it's crazy, right? Like all of these things move. 
So the, lar the more in the money, so if you're at 150 and CRM's at 160, when it goes to 170, this delta is going to continue to get bigger and bigger. So if the stock is moving in your favor, you're going to make more and more money. Okay? Now, guess what? If it moves against you, you're going to lose more and more money. So it becomes more and more exponential, right? So once again, you're going to have to hear this three or four times, and you're going to have to look at this. But you can see right here, it's at 61 cents here, the 140. The stock was at 143. So you can see at 145, it's 51. And then you can see at 150, it's 41. So when I go to my summary of what to do, I always buy the conservative calls. Why? Because I have a larger probability and I'm, I'm buying a safer, I'm spending more, but I'm getting safety. And this is one of the big reasons I'm getting safety. Okay, theta, time decay. Contract becomes worth less and less over time. So you can see theta, every day you lose two cents, basically on this contract, okay? I'm gonna give you some rules of thumb for this, but just remember, also theta, the closer you get to expiration, it starts to go more exponential. You'll get to 15, 20 cents a day as you start to get closer. I'm gonna show you how to combat that. Gamma, there's a rate of change that delta moves. So gamma will tell you how much that this moves. It's two cents, right, gamma. From 140 to 145, this moves from 61 to 51. Two cents times $5, 10 cents. Everybody see that? That's how these things come in. Uh, and then there's implied volatility. And, and implied volatility is really important. Uh, the higher the implied volatility, the more expensive the option. The lower the implied volatility, the less expensive the option. Now, let's get out of this. There's also, there's also Rho, uh, which is based upon like long-term interest rates and stuff. Don't worry about it. For three-month trades, you don't, need, you don't need to worry about it. Let's go to the next slide. Worse is over. Thank you. Now, my basic rules, because I, I see people nodding off. My basic rules that will keep you out of trouble. Remember, first of all, buying options are callish. Buying option puts are bearish. It's an upside-down call. My rule, you always want to buy at the money or one to two strikes into the money. Your delta is higher, you have much less risk. You have a lower break-even point as well. Always buy one month longer than you think you need to make the move. You pay more, but remember, theta, the time decay, accelerates the closer you get to expiration. So if you buy one month longer than you think you need, you never get into that rapid decay. You pay a little more for the contract, but they're so leveraged anyway, does it really matter, right? Again, I'm not a home run hitter, I'm a base hitter. And this is who I am. This helps to avoid the rapid time decay like we talked about. The other thing, don't buy when implied volatility is really high. Well, implied volatility is how much the market expects a stock to make a move. So, as an example, look at Facebook right before earnings. Look at the implied volatility, very high, right? Do you want to be buying a call up here? No, you don't, right? You want to be buying when it's least expensive or unexpensive down here. When implied volatility is high, what do you want to do? You want to be a seller, right? So I like to sell, so I'm looking for when the market is nervous, for when stocks are expected to make big moves because the prices move dramatically with implied volatility. And I'll give you an example, UVXY, I think everybody knows UVXY, moves crazy, right? UVXY took a big spike up. We all know how the market overreacts. So I made a mistake one time and I bought puts. So what was I doing? I was buying a put basically when the implied volatility was really high and I bought puts and I loaded up on them, right? Because I know UVXY is gonna come back down. The problem, problem is, is the implied volatility started to drop. I was down five bucks and it was moving in my favor. I was excited because I saw UBXY. I went to open my account thinking, man, I'm, I might as well take a month off and go someplace and have some fun, right? I was barely at break even after five bucks because I ignored the correlation between implied volatility and the price. What should I have been doing? I should have been selling calls because the implied volatility is high, not buying puts. So once again, hey Brian, so can I ask a question on that? So yeah. When you say don't buy when implied volatility is high, 
is there a certain like uh, hurdle you're thinking of for the exact number or are you just looking at it relative to the relative. stock? I use relative, so I look back. So you can see it's pretty easy to see that you're at a high level here and you're at a relatively low level here. And that's one of the things I love about, about TC2000 specifically is because I'll chart all this stuff for you. You can even see how the options are moving in here. So personally, if I buy, I only hold for a short period of time and I sell back to the market. So these are the rules that I live by to help me overcome the downside to the options, right? So I don't hold till expiration because that time decay eats me up, right? So I'm only gonna buy a buy a call if I think it's, if the implied volatility is low, but I'm expecting a bounce or something, right? Also what I've done here is I've put two different uh, calls together. This one, you can see the dash line. So it's a 170 call. Over here is a 190 call, right? I want you to look at your break even points. This does a real nice job of showing you how much you'll lose depending upon the price. These are at expiration though, they're at expiration. Or how much you will make. You can see right here, because of the call, the price of Facebook at $13, right? I buy a 170 strike, it's got to get to 183 to break even. Because I had to pay $13 for the call, right? That's a pretty big move. That's if I hold till expiration. So you gotta get a $13, that's why I don't hold till expiration. So you're paying $13 each share? Each share, okay. correct. Okay. So it cost me $1,370, right? What did you say, how much? $1,370. Okay. Okay. Yeah, or excuse me, I'm sorry, $1,305, or yeah, $1,305. It's okay. just times 100 down there, right? Okay. So I have to get to here. Now on the one, the 190, it's cheaper, right? Look at the 190, it's only $3.55. So what's the downside? My delta, I'm only making 48 cents for every dollar the stock moves. Make sense? For the, one four, or the 170, I'm making 62 cents. Look at my break even point. My break even point, man, that's so high, I can't even tell you what it is. Like 193, I think, or whatever. So you can see my break even point, right? So to be conservative, because we're so leveraged anyway, these are basically all the rules that you need to remember. So. But now I think you're starting to understand why I prefer to sell options because time's on your side when you sell, right? So when I sell that option, I sell it for say $1,000. As it gets closer and closer to expiration, it's worth less and less. It's like shorting a stock. I could go by, back in and close that position and I keep the difference just like when you short, okay? Or I just let them expire worthless, which I do most of the time. So it kind of makes some sense? Yeah. Okay, cool. Next slide. Puts, real quick. A put is an upside down call. So you, you, it's a bearish trade, right? So you can see your loss is if it goes up, your, sale, your, your gain if it goes down. It's all the same thing. I like puts better than I like shorting. One of the reasons why is if something happens, and there was a guy that had to create a GoFundMe page where he had a, he shorted like a biomed, you can all, you got, you and Paul probably heard about this, right? Yeah. Like some biotech stock, he shorted it, and they had like a monster position. That came out with a buyout. Somebody went to buy him out. It was up, like say he was a thousand shares short, it went up to like, it was like at 10 bucks, it went to like 230 the next morning. He was 220,000 in the hole because he had shorted that. He created a GoFundMe page and all this and that. I mean, you can imagine the trouble he's in. With the put, the maximum amount that you can lose is whatever you paid for the put. You can't lose anymore. So in my opinion, for shorting, it, if a stock is optionable, it's much, much better to buy puts. Now, if a stock's gonna hang around forever, you get into time decay before it starts to go down. But we know, and we've seen it with a lot of the exponential moves that you'll see in some of these stocks, like IQ is an example. If it's optionable, you can buy the put. Think about it too, because if you spend a quarter of what you what you use in margin to short that stock, you can make three, four times more, right? <clears throat> so just remember. So basically, that's it. So what? So what is a put? Option put. It's a right to sell the stock instead of buy it at that strike price at at time of expiration. Okay. Note that the higher the strike, the deeper in the money. So it's in reverse, right? So here you can see the stock's at 207, right? It's at 207. 220 is higher, 
So now it's more expensive, right? Because the more it moves down from 220, the more money you make. So you're gonna see it's just like an upside down call is all it is, it works exactly the same. Your max loss like can be $785, okay? Or 700 and, I'm sorry, 85. Oh, the reason I went 85 is because instead of going to that price, I went to the ask, right? Because you're buying at the ask. $785, so it can be less risk than shorting. Note that your break even is your strike. Now your strike minus the cost is where that stock's gotta get down to before you make money. There's intrinsic value, right? So you're buying the 210, the stock's at 27, so you already have $3 in value, right? So you have $3 in value. Uh, please forgive me. Yeah, so uh, my math was wrong, apologize guys, that should be $3 in one sense. But the time value that you have is the price minus this. So how much are you paying for time? The time premium is the price of the option minus the intrinsic value, okay? Which is the 785 minus the $2 that you already have in intrinsic value. So you're paying $5.84 for time is what you're paying for. Now you know why I like to sell, right? Because look how much time you're paying for. And if it decays the closer you get, then I try to keep those premiums. You don't have to hold the expiration. Remember, you can always sell it back. Same basic rules apply to buying a call, just upside down. Next slide. Guys, you're troopers for hanging through this. First time I heard this, I was aggravated at the guy and he was boring me to death. But I have to tell you some stuff to keep you out of trouble because more than likely, many of you are gonna try it and if you don't know about the applied volatility, you're getting in trouble. So you'll hate me now, someday you'll look back and go, man, that was a great guy. So. <laughs> uh, I run through a call trade here. I think I've walked you through pretty well. You guys can go back. Anybody wants a copy of this, uh, we can go back through. Let's go to the next slide and go ahead. We, we beat that enough. Now, if you understand buying calls and puts, that's it. Every one of these strategies right here, every one of these strategies involves either buying or selling calls and puts. That's it. So you hear about complex option strategies. So here, this strategy, Ulta, love Ulta, what a great stock. Good company, has volatility, it moves, right? This one is actually called a long straddle. I love TC2000 because it gives you a graphic. Basically, if the stock doesn't move very much, you're gonna lose some money. If it moves, either to put spreads are probably the finest investment for building wealth that has ever been created. And I know I seem dramatic over that, but I love short put spreads. Oh, so that's what I use. So TC2000 has got a really, really nice layout uh, for showing you that. And I don't, I'm not gonna go through all of those, but anyway, so those. So here you see long call, right? Pretty simple. Goes down, you lose money. Notice, notice your loss is capped though. See how once it hits a certain level, that loss, the red only is so thick, so you're limited, right? But look at your gain. See how it's unlimited as it's going up? Does that make sense? So that little graphic's pretty good for showing you different strategies. So let's go ahead and go to the next slide. Uh, my layouts, and people can say, man, you've got paralysis by analysis, right? <laughs> but when I, when I look at this, this is what I look at. Everything that these guys have taught me, I've put into these layouts, right? What do I look at? I look at the sectors, right? Sectors are very, very important. Stocks tend to move with their sectors. I look at the dailies. I also look at the weeklies, right? I love the clean, the cleanliness of the weeklies. Look at your resistance levels. See that when you use the bodies? Look how nice that that fits, right, on the weeklies. So I always use that when I'm, when I'm making my positions. You know, it's cleaner to me and I see it. Now I still use the dailies for entries, right? It's like using a microscope, kind of, if you will, for like dissection or something like that. But uh, so here you go, I look at volume. So I have volume on here. I use stochastics for overbought and oversold. I also use Bollinger Bands. Some people don't like them, I tend to like them. I use money flow indexes, because uh, it incorporates stochastics but has a volume aspect to it for being overbought and oversold. These don't trigger my trades, they're just in my mind to help me be more bullish or less bullish. I use checking money flow, I wanna see how money's flowing. Is it flowing in, is it flowing out? I do look at RSI too, basically the same as stochastics, but 
anyway, so over here, what you'll see, I look at sales trends. Sales to me are one of the most important deciding factors over how a stock is going to do. Look at Tesla. The stock, this stock has been losing money. They're at minus four dollars and twenty cents a share. They've been bleeding money, right? Wall Street has actually been liking them because look at their sales trend. Just remember, if there's demand for your product, there's demand for your product. Most people are optimistic and they think that you can correct your operating inefficiencies. So if I see rising sales, I tend to be very bullish on a stock. And especially if it's getting beat up a little bit, as long as there's liquidity, I do that. I do look at PE ratio. Be careful with price to earnings. One of the reasons why a company can buy back shares so there's less shares on the market, their PE can look better, right? But they're not really making any more money. Does that make sense? So be careful for PE. I just kind of use it as an analysis versus the rest of the peers in our group. Are they really high or really low? That kind of thing. So you want to be careful. I look at debt to equity. So if your debt to equity is pretty good, then I'll take longer term trades on companies. If they have a tremendous amount of debt and they've got no equity, I'm obviously scared, right? With liquidation, those types of things. So once again, that's why you see these on a weekly, because I'm more interested in these for long terms and I'm looking at money flow a lot. And once again, I always, always, always am aware of what's going on in the market. I, can, I have a different screen now to do this, but anyway, next slide. A uh, couple slides that I use, these are my morning gappers. As an example, I like to have them all on one page. I used to scan and, uh, and uh, someone very near and dear to me told me, so you're missing moves. So you gotta, you gotta help out your stocks on one screen. So I did. I like to have the dailies next to them. That's up to you, but you can see right here. Look, I always watch pre-market data too. See the pre-market right here? Look what I have tab. See there's another tab right there? I can click on that tab and it, this, the, this chart does not have the pre-market stuff on there because it will skew your moving averages. So all I gotta do is click on that and all of a sudden all my pre-market data is gone. Does that make sense? So that's one layout, let's go to the next one. The reason I wanna show you my layouts is because sometimes it's like some people benefit my things and some people don't. You can see how different people look at it. So this is my scanner. So once I'm gonna take a trade or I'm really interested in the day trade on something, obviously I wanna know the daily. I'm looking at the one minute. Obviously, I want to know where the pre-market levels are, that kind of stuff, first thing in the morning. You can see those. So I have the one minute and the two minute. I use the one minute right at the open. After a little bit, the volatility starts to go down. I go to the two minute, so I'm watching the two minute. A little bit later in the day, I'm watching the five minute. Sometimes there'll be some noise on the one minute, but I see an ORB or I see something like that, like an opening range break that's more visible in the five. This only takes me a split second for me to go, and I'm there. At first, it looks like there's a lot of noise, but you get used to it, right? A doctor doesn't pick up an MRI and look at his first one and go, oh, this guy's got a contusion here or whatever, right? He looks at thousands of them before it starts to make sense. So the other thing I told you, I love the longer time frames. I was talking to Kanal, I told him I like the longer time frame, and he said, hey, talk to this guy. So I went and talked to this guy, and please forgive me, I don't remember his name, he's pretty awesome, but he used the hourlies, right? So I have the hourly on here, but look, what you don't see in the shorter time frames, you can see it in the dailies, but sometimes it's not as visible. Look at, you have support here. Look at that resistance level here. Do you see that? And you can see support here on the hourly. You see support here. Now you'd see it on the daily, but this just really cleans up the certain levels to me, right? Resistance, resistance, resistance. Remember, these are days apart. So although you'll see them back here, this just makes it much more visible to me. So I'm a big hourly guy. I love the hourlies, and I know that's kind of odd. But. So my scanners are down here, my gap downs, my gap ups. Uh, these are all the common US stocks. So I can just quick filter up and down. Sometimes they won't be gapping, but they'll be moving. These are high volatility stocks. These are the favorites that I love to trade. And then here I have the 18 that I watch uh, more intraday kind of stuff. And then I have the stuff that I own and all that kind of stuff over there. Let's go to the next slide. Oh, oh, man. <laughs> now, I know. I know. Paul's laughing because Paul and I've had a lot of discussions about me missing moves or whatever, you know, and all this and that. This looks crazy to you. I know a laptop it is, but I'll show you my home setup in a little bit. All I'm looking for are breaks of certain things. 
certain patterns, right? So it's not all the detail, but if I'm intraday trading, then this is what I'll, I'll, I'll look for, right? So, and this is what I use. Now I know it looks crazy, but believe it or not, like I look at it now and it will literally take me about five to 10 seconds to get through all 18 of these stocks to see if they're gonna be making moves or if I think they're worth taking a shot at, right? So, and, and right here, the other thing too is I don't have to, I sort of set these up to run on a laptop if I want to, but I can go to a daily right here too to look at the video. Go to the next slide. Sector analysis, this is super important to me. I wanna know what the sectors are doing, so I do this a lot. Paul talks about this in the, uh, in the boot camp and stuff as well, so it's very important to me. Once again, I, I like the weeklies a lot, right? You can see it back here. You see those resistance levels now becoming support, like on the steel sector, if you will. But look how clean it is on the weekly, right? That's just really pretty. I'm also gonna tell you, I see tons of correlation. Look at the 20 exponentials coming up. And a lot of times if I don't see, like I can't tell you why something's bouncing over here on the daily. When I look at the weekly, it's like obvious, man. It's right on the 50 or it's right, you know. So I just encourage you to just kind of expand and do that kind of stuff. Next slide. I pay real, a lot of attention to the markets. Obviously, I told you to trade with the markets. So every day, I'm looking at where's the S&P. If I'm up in here at a resistance level, right, we're pulling back, starting to retest that level, right? We broke it, we're pulling back to retest that level. I'm starting to maybe lay a little bit lower on my swing trades, I'm starting to taper off. I always pay attention to where the NASDAQ's doing and the Russell 2000. The T2108, because it's all the stocks averaged together, are gonna very closely mimic IWM. But if the T2108 is diving and the S&P's going up, once again, your foundation's starting to crumble, you may be looking at a pretty big pullback. And Paul talks about all that kind of stuff in the boot camp too. Next slide. This is my training setup at home. <laughs> I run three, four, and please, it's just, my wife's like, oh, you're, you're a nerd, man. Only, only a nerd would show people their training setup, right? But I'm really proud of this. <laughs> because, but, but I run three 43-inch 4K Dell monitors. Ooh. Be careful if you're trying to run a 4K TV. A 4K TV will look pretty good, but it just does not have the same definition and clarity that a 4K monitor does. Okay, so you can see my water bottle, and I told you I was a big baseball fan. It was a, that was a baseball from opening day at one of the Tigers games that I was at. So that's my training setup. But now as you can see, look at these 18 stocks. They don't look so bad there, right? Yeah. So, and then I, you know, I've got all my different time frames and that. So I tend to try to take in a lot of, a lot of information. And uh, that, uh, next slide. Yeah, lastly, and I thank you guys for putting up with me. It was the biggest honor I've ever had to get to come up here in front of you guys. Because, uh, man, I make mistakes every day, but I'm telling you, just hang on like a pit bull and you'll get there. Uh, so, why a trade? Sorry, you can laugh at me. I love my family. They mean the world to me, so I always get a little bit clipped when I speak about them. But I trade for security for my, myself, for my family. I trade for retirement and peace of mind. I trade to leave a wealth bucket to my son and uh, I give the utmost thanks to Bulls on Wall Street. Sorry guys if I make you feel a little uncomfortable when you get the clamp. But uh, you don't know how flippin' thankful I am to you. Uh, you guys have my respect and utmost and admiration. And I'm gonna tell you something very personal. I was employed for 23 years, never was unemployed for a day. I took a big risk and I went to a startup company for a portion of that company to be promised to me at time of sale. So you, so you understand, I get a part of the company after five years and we decided to sell it. I went and it was a disaster, it worked out. The guy was very wealthy that I, I, I partnered with on this. But uh, so after a very short period, about six months, it did, was not working, I ended up leaving. And uh, because of what I've learned in trading and the security that it's brought to me and my family, it was the first time ever I was out of work. And you can see what we were doing the next week. I was not worried, we were in Disney. So that's why I get so beclimped. God bless you guys. You guys are awesome, man. So that's it, guys. Thanks, and it's a big laugh.